Hi, everyone. Good morning and good afternoon, wherever you are in the world. And welcome to session 26 of the annual meeting of the Alliance for Child Protection and Humanitarian Action. My name is Yang, and I'm going to start with just some brief housekeeping. Um, and without further ado, I'm so happy to be here to introduce session 26, which is titled Food for Thought, Tips for Advocacy with Food Security Actors. And my name is Yang Fu. I work as a child protection and food security focal point with Plan International. We've already heard throughout this annual meeting about the centrality of children's protection and multi-sectoral programming. But today for the next hour and a half, we're gonna discuss how to promote collaboration specifically between ourselves as child protection actors and between the food security sector. And I think, as we all know, collaboration between child protection and food security is still, I would say, in its nascent stages. We really can't talk about child protection and food security collaboration in the same way as we do with sectors like GBV, education, or MHPSS, but that's, the, that's what we're striving towards. As the world is facing a global hunger crisis, we as child protection actors also need to work to overcome um, our shyness, our lack of confidence in engaging food security actors, and we also need to work together to find effective strategies um, to engage the food security sector. So today's session is broken up into three parts. Um, the first part um, will touch upon why we believe collaboration between child protection and food security actors is important and particularly relevant in this moment in history. In the second part, we'll discuss how to effectively advocate for greater child protection and food security collaboration with support from our panel of speakers. And the final part, we'll summarize key points and we'll answer questions or comments from, from the chat and from our participants, as well as share relevant resources. So that's the outline of our session today. And I'm very grateful and very lucky to be supported by the following colleagues. So this is Marta Ricci, CPIE specialist from Plan Germany, um, Christina Majorano from the global food security sector, Francesco Caburu from the child protection area of responsibility in South Sudan, and Elizabeth Trevlo from the USAID's Bureau of Humanitarian Assistance. There aren't any breakout rooms for this uh, session, but we are going to be using Mentimeter polls to hear your thoughts and opinions. So um, please feel free to click on the Mentimeter link and to join us for our brief opening, um, opening um, icebreaker Mentimeters. And I'll let um, Natalie uh, support me in changing the screen so we can see the Mentimeter screen and we can go to our first question. So the first question asks, in your current role, um, are you working on child protection issues which are exacerbated, which are affected, which are driven by food insecurity or lack of livelihood? So the options are yes and no. What I can see from the chat is so far, by far the majority of um, our colleagues are saying yes. We know that food security isn't the only driver of child protection risks, but we are seeing in many contexts that it is a significant driver and it plays a significant role across all contexts even across um, contexts which are uh, developed in high income contexts. I'm actually curious to hear from the colleagues who said no, which settings you're working in or which specific child protection issues you're working on. So feel free to put those in the chat as well. I think from uh, our engagement with various child protection actors across the globe, we're finding evidence that food security is linked to almost every child protection risk. And my colleague, Marta, is gonna share a bit more about that. I'm gonna move on to our second Mentimeter question, which asks, have you ever collaborated with a food security actor? And what do I mean by collaboration? This could be to identify needs, to plan joint responses, to design programs, or to monitor results. So perhaps you have, and it's going really well in case, do let us know. 
perhaps it's not, um, or perhaps you're trying, but it's not working really well. And maybe this actually isn't something that you've even started working on. So we'd just love to hear and get a sense from the audience. What is our previous experience coming into this meeting in working with child protection colleagues? Um, my screen is a bit small, but I see it split across all three. Um, so two colleagues are saying, yes, it's working well. A third is saying they're trying, but it's not been so successful. And then the rest are saying that they've never tried. So for those of you who said you have tried and it is working well, please do stay on this session because we really want to hear from you how you've managed to make this work and the lessons that you've learned. If you've said um, you've tried, but you've not been successful, we also encourage you to stay because you might get some new tips from our panelists. And then finally, if you said um, you haven't tried, you're not sure how to get started, maybe this is a session that can uh, motivate you to try to do something within the context that you're working in. So thanks so much, everybody, for these responses. Um, I'm going to go back to the PowerPoint presentation now. And just to share the overall purpose of this session. So we're really hoping that after this session, we can all walk away with some tips, some advice for child protection and humanitarian action actors on how to advocate for increased collaboration between child protection and food security colleagues. I've been working on this issue for a short while now, and I think what I've really realized is that advocacy is such a core component of trying to achieve any type of cross-sector collaboration. Even if it's doing a joint assessment, even if it's referring families from one sector to another, we can't really achieve anything alone as child protection actors without getting other key stakeholders, decision makers, and sometimes even our own managers on board. So it's really important for us to know who to target and how to target them. Um, so I'm gonna uh, move us on to the first session of this, um, of this uh, session. And that is just quickly highlighting why is child protection and food security collaboration even important and relevant? And we've learned a bit from a global initiative that we've done lately. And I'm going to invite my colleague, Marta, from Plan Germany, to share with us what this initiative has been and what some of the uh, evidence findings have been. So, um, Marta, over to you, and I think over to the next slide. Thank you, Yang. Yeah, and thank you for this introduction. I will start giving a bit of the ground of the initiative. So in 2022, Plan Germany and the Global Child Protection Area of Responsibility became a partnership to strengthen cooperation between child protection and the food security sectors. This initiative was born of two reasons. The first was that across all humanitarian contexts, we were seeing very little collaboration between these two sectors. And the second was the child protection actors were requesting support on how to collaborate with food security actors. So this initiative had two phases. The first supported by the global CPOR through funding from the USAID Bureau for Humanitarian Assistance. At the current phase, supported by the German Federal Foreign Office, GFFO, through a global consortium project led by Plan Germany called Joining Forces for Child Protection in Emergencies. So as part of this initiative, one of the first things that we did was review the evidence on how child protection concerns were linked with food security. And to do so, we launched a global evidence review. Next slide, please. Thank you. So the evidence review was necessary because although we've been hearing about links between growth, lack of livelihoods, poverty, cuts in food rations, and others which are protection concerns, we didn't have a global picture yet. And as food insecurity continues to be on the rise, we wanted to understand how food insecurity impacts children's protection and any good or promising practices around that. What we found is that food insecurity is linked with all types of child protection risks, 
the food insecurity worsen mental health and psychosocial well-being of children and caregivers and this results in poorer care for children increased exposure to intimate partner violence and fighting between peers in addition families and children adopt negative copy mechanisms to acquire food and this includes child marriage child labor sexual exploitation and family separation again what we found is that when food is scarce children spend more time trying to find food or to prepare food including collecting water and collecting firewood and in several cases sexual and gender-based violence dangers and injuries associated with this was the most cited risk for children and this was reported by children themselves and community members and finally, we found out that food insecurity interventions themselves can unintentionally pose risks for children if children's protection is not considered as part of planning, designing, and implementation of food security intervention. So, yeah, clearly, to, see, to respond to your question on how to prevent and mitigate child protection risk through this evidence, we really saw that having to have multi-sectoral responses, child protection actors and food security actors must work together. Thank you. Over to you. Thanks, Marta. Thanks for summarizing that so concisely. You can find more details and country-specific examples in the report. Um, but I think this has been so helpful to flag why collaboration is really relevant, because none of these issues can be addressed by our sector alone. Um, on the next slide, you can see some examples of how child protection and food security actors have collaborated in different settings. And these, uh, these examples are a combination of actions which are either more specific to child protection mainstreaming or integrated programming. So that includes things like having joint uh, needs assessments and joint analysis, planning interventions together, and that includes jointly determining um, selection criteria and doing targeting exercises, specifically looking to improve referral pathways between both sectors, conducting child protection risk assessments of food, insecure, food security interventions and tailoring food security responses as a result, designing integrated, um, designing and implementing integrated child protection and food security programs where the ultimate objective or goal is really children's holistic well-being. Doing consultations with children and adolescents from food insecure um, contexts to identify solutions and hear how issues are impacting them. And then also ensuring that all feedback mechanisms, including those established in food insecure areas or as part of food security responses specifically, are child friendly and accessible to children of, of all ages and backgrounds. So these were some of the examples that we found and we've shared these in previous webinars and presentations. So we're not going to go through specific examples again, but we will share links to them at the end of this session. Um, for the colleagues on the call who said that they had successful examples of, of collaboration across child protection and food security, please do feel free to add those examples in the chat because we're constantly looking for more examples to document, um, and this is really useful. And we collected these examples through three workshops uh, that we conducted last year as part of the global initiative that Marta presented. And these workshops were in Nigeria, South Sudan, and the Central African Republic. Um, so on the next slide, you can see um, a sample of the workshop agenda, the participants, as well as the objectives that were set. And the purpose was really to bring together child protection and food security actors working in each of these contexts to understand in these contexts how our issues and sectors were already linked, to look at some of the good practices, to strengthen our knowledge and skills in order to design integrated programming, and to find ways forward to strengthen collaboration across both these sectors. So we heard of some good examples from various types of organizations, but we also heard um, that collaboration was actually quite difficult in many cases, it was uneven. So it was uneven across the country or it started and stopped. 
um, sometimes a really good practice just wasn't replicated or scaled up. And in some cases, this also led to frustration. So I think we're going to go to our next mentee meter question, and we'd just like to hear from you. In your experience, what have been some of the main barriers to collaboration between child protection and food security actors? So feel free to go back into the Mentimeter link. If you can't access the Mentimeter link, you're always welcome to write it in the chat. Um, but we'd just like to hear from you what are some of the challenges that you may have experienced in your uh, previous or current attempts to foster collaboration. Has it been the lack of technical knowledge or expertise, limited financial resources? Perhaps it's been some of the restrictions set out by donors or other actors. Are you struggling to find tools and resources? Or is it something other, something that we haven't listed and we have not listed all the challenges, trust me. So we'd just love to hear from you um, in your experience, what have been some of the challenges and feel free to select the two most common that you've experienced either directly or indirectly. And I can see from, I can see from the, um, results that lack of guidance and tools, but limited financial resources is currently in the lead, followed by a lack of expertise or lack of knowledge in the other sector. So while we wait for some other responses to come in, I want to um, ask my colleague Francesco from the CPOR in South Sudan. Francesco, when you see that limited financial resources is coming up as the top barrier. Does that surprise you? Do you have any thoughts about this? Good afternoon, everyone. Actually, it doesn't surprise me. Mm, limited financial uh, resources uh, um, often comes up uh, as uh, one of the main barriers to the collaboration between child protection and food security. Uh, in my uh, perspective, this challenge can uh, be and should be uh, transformed uh, in an opportunity. You see, as humanitarians, uh, uh, we are asked to focus, among, uh, among other actions, uh, on two uh, main directions when we, mm, uh, when we are involved in our uh, strategic planning processes. We have to prioritize, and uh, uh, we can't do that uh, in a silos. Mm, child protection can't just look at its own vulnerability criteria and food security uh, proceed in other directions. Mm, unfortunately, uh, we do see a, a lot of standalone programs, uh, though uh, we are aware that these standalone programs, especially where uh, funding is shrinking, mm, the, these standalone programs can't uh, stop the vicious cycle of uh, abuse against children. So uh, we do have to look at uh, integrated uh, response plans. I know this uh, sounds uh, easier said than done, but we have good examples out there. Uh, I will expand a bit more on them. For now, I'd just like to mention how uh, these uh, good examples from other contexts uh, um, guy are inspiring us in South Sudan. Uh, for instance, right now uh, within the framework of the response to the Sudanese crisis, the CPOR is uh, making is trying to make sure uh, whenever we uh, set up a child-friendly space. A WFP can provide uh, a high energy biscuits to the children in our CFSs. So this is a way for WFP to reach out very quickly among the most vulnerable uh, members of the community. And at the same time, as CPO actors, we can expand the coverage of the needs uh, of the children we support. Thank you. Thanks so much for that, Francesco. I loved hearing such a recent example. Um, and indeed, I'm, I'm not so surprised either that limited financial resources has come out as a barrier. We did a survey with child protection and food security actors across CAR, Nigeria, and South Sudan last year. And the two most frequently cited um, barriers were limited financial resources and then also lack of guidance and tools. And I think um, more and more what I'm feeling is that advocacy is a key component to addressing both of these. So to thinking about how we can either increase funding 
or use our limited resources more effectively, like your like the example you gave Francesco from South Sudan just now, or um, when developing tools and guidelines. Nothing developed by the child protection sector alone, um, um, you know, can be truly effective because we need the technical expertise and knowledge of our colleagues in the food security sector. So thanks so much, Francesco, for, for sharing your feedback on that. Um, I'm going to move us on now to the next session. Sorry, the next part of the session. And this part is going to look at um, what do we mean when we talk about a child protection and food security advocacy strategy? So why am I, why am I using this term? What am I actually talking about? Um, when I think of a child protection and food security advocacy strategy, um, on the next slide, I'm essentially talking about efforts to persuade humanitarian actors to improve collaboration between our sectors, between child protection and food security, with the ultimate aim of better addressing all the child protection risks and concerns that are associated with food insecurity, with food security programming, and then through that improving children's protection and holistic well-being. Um, and in order to do this, um, we definitely need an advocacy strategy. And any good advocacy strategy should be context specific and have a context analysis, have clear targets, have some defined tactics, as well as some key messages. And that's what my three panelists today are going to help me along with everyone on the call, um, all the participants in beginning to develop for the rest of this session. So um, I think if we move to the next slide, um, we wanna think about who are the targets of a child protection and food security advocacy strategy and who should be the targets, who should we prioritize. So in a minute, we're going to go to a Mentimeter poll to ask you, in your opinion, who should be prioritized as targets in a child protection and food security um, advocacy strategy. But before then, I'm just going to highlight some possible targets and allies of this strategy. And perhaps I've missed some actors um, from this table, so please feel free to add them into the chat. Um, the first possible target is obviously uh, food security, CSOs, NGOs, INGOs, really the organizations who are doing service delivery um, at field and on the ground. Um, they're the ones who are supporting targeting and selection criteria, delivering resources, monitoring programs, and they work with various donors. The second target group are UN agencies. So those, for example, with a mandate to address food security, um, they fund programs, and as well, they are also funded themselves by other donors. We then have national governments who then set overall strategies, policies, and play a key role in coordination. We have the CPOR and the food security cluster here, so I can't forget our coordination mechanisms who are responsible for coordinating preparedness and response activities, setting agendas, and who are made up of all these representatives from governments, NGOs, and human agencies. And then finally, donors um, who then fund programs to all of these actors. Um, and some donors have specific interests or specific focus areas um, on protection or child protection and on food security themselves. So just thinking about these actors, um, I'm going to um, go to the Mentimeter poll now for our fourth question. And in this question, we'd like to hear from you, which of these actors do you think should be prioritized for child protection and food security advocacy? So feel free to go back into the Mentimeter link or to write it in the chat. And we'd like to hear from you, who do you think should be prioritized? And maybe as I wait for um, colleagues to re-enter the mentee and to share their feedback, um, I am going to ask um, Beth 
from BHA um, who she thinks should be prioritized in terms of child protection and food security act um, advocacy before I also get the viewpoint of Christina in terms of who should be prioritized. So Beth, maybe while we're waiting for colleagues to go back into the mentee and rank, um, which I know takes a bit of time, um, can we hear from you your thoughts on child protection and food security advocacy and who should be prioritized as a target? All right, and Yang, I'm gonna say I'm changing my answer right oh. now. On this. <laughs> Reading, I'm watching the last poll results and I would say it's ourselves as wow. protection directors. Um, if we are saying we need more guidance and we do not have enough resources, I think we really need to relook at what are we really, how do I want to say it? How key do we believe food is to um, the lives of children? Um, and can we just put on our practical, rational brains for a moment? Um, the comment that Michelle has put in the comment section that says we also tend to just stick with the way of working that we know I would so firmly agree with. We don't know what we don't know. So we assume we need more finances, more guidance in order to achieve this <laughs> seemingly new outcome of integrating with food actors, in, which is a mutually beneficial um, activity for both of our sectors. Um, and I think it's, <laughs> I think it's much more simple and I'm bouncing around because this is a thought that is just coming as we're having this discussion now. Um, but what Francesco said around, we need to look at what works very firmly believe we do simply need to identify one, two actions that works, even if it's not in our space. I just had a call with WFP this morning uh, in another country around how is it that they are integrating nutrition and food as in nutrition partners who are not attached to WFP um, and how are their beneficiaries getting on the same list. Um, but it's finding simple spaces, um, simple wins and taking it and applying it. And we're not saying we need to do all of our activities together forever and ever. We're saying let's find one or two wins and lean in there. Um, of course, we know all, um, all our ways of working, developing processes, having policies that support us leaning in, but I think we as protection advocates simply need to decide for ourselves, is this important? Um, and know from the evidence that is out there, and thank you um, to PLAN and the CPAOR for the fantastic evidence review that gives so many reasons um, that we do need to work together. Um, but let me just uh, jump into this, uh, now my real, real point really quick. <laughs> Um, WFP is the biggest actor in the room when it comes to food security and absolutely want them on board. And WFP is on board at the global level, um, very much leaning in on their protection and accountability policy. They also have a gender policy. Um, you'll see protection experts, gender experts in the field more and more. Um, the difference is with every, with every every agency, what's at the um, HQ level does not necessarily trickle down to the country level as fast. Um, and so when it comes to advocacy at the country level, um, aside from relationship building, which I'll emphasize throughout this discussion, um, I would say we can simply um, continue to remind actors such as WFP of their commitments um, that they have identified at the global level. And also, particularly for WFP, they are not a protection agency. We all are within protection agencies. And so while they will do the protection mainstreaming, um, we are able to come and support their um, food beneficiaries with protection services. So we need to look at ourselves as a win for, for food actors as well. Um, so let me stop there. Thanks, Beth. I really appreciate this honest um, and on the spot reflection as well. And I think actually that might, what you said might resonate really well with 
um, Christina. So Christina from the Global CPOR, can I just ask who you think should be some of the primary targets for child protection and food security advocacy? Hi, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, depending on where you are. Um, just a small collection I'm from the Global Food Security Cluster. <laughs> but uh, indeed, I wish I could say as well, especially today, that I'm from the Global CPAOR um, and we've been working quite a lot together. So uh, I feel part of me is, <laughs> is within the CPAOR. Um, no, I'm glad actually about the comments that Beth has just uh, made. Um, I do believe that indeed these are all very important targets for the advocacy initiatives, but the child protection actors themselves, they have a role and they could be themselves target of advocacy initiatives from the civil society organizations, the national or the international NGOs. And so, for instance, if we take an agency like, like UNICEF that has the lead on child protection in terms of the sector, they could also um, indeed take the lead in promoting the collaboration between the two sectors. Uh, and that I believe is very much needed in, uh, in various countries. Uh, at the same time, I'm thinking, um, Beth was talking about uh, finding those couple of things that work and implement them, right? Uh, there are organizations that have an expertise and they have operations in both sectors, in child protection and in food security, and they would be probably the perfect implementers of an integrated program. So if they were able to um, to have their teams working together and not in silos, because sometimes even within the same organization, child protection and food security teams do not work together. But if they're able to work together and uh, uh, implement maybe new approaches or an integrated program that sometimes is not necessarily new, they could show the added value of this uh, collaboration to the wider community. They could show what works and this could open the way for a wider collaboration among the two sectors. So maybe that would be my contribution in addition to what participants have rightly pointed out. Thank you, Yang. Thanks so much, Christina, from the Global Food Security Cluster. I promise that I do know that. Apologies for my brain slip. Um, and I think both of your points, Christina and Elizabeth, are really interesting. And I think challenge a bit what we're seeing in the chat about donors being prioritized in CP and food security advocacy. I'm gonna put a pin in that discussion because we're gonna come back to that a little bit later and really challenge ourselves as I think humanitarian actors as to whether it's really donors that are stopping us from collaboration. So let's, um, let's move ahead and go back to the PowerPoint. Um, and we'll keep hearing from all of our, our panelists. So um, in developing an advocacy strategy, uh, yes, um, it's important to understand the positions and the perspectives of the key stakeholders who will be targeted. And so we need to understand what is the starting point of all these various targets. And, Given that I have representatives of three targets on the call, I'm going to ask them and start with Francesco. So Francesco, representing the CP area of responsibility, we know that child protection coordination plays a key role in advancing this discussion, also in bringing together and mobilizing child protection actors and uh, like Beth has said, for us as a community to really decide whether or not this is a priority. So Francesca, can you tell us a bit more about how child protection coordination can contribute to advancing this topic and how other child protection actors can engage? Do you think this is a priority area of focus for child protection and child protection coordinators? Yeah, uh, thank you once again for the question. Uh, I, I do believe uh, CP coordinators have a a key role in advancing the discussion with other actors. And I will answer with an example. Uh, in um, Somalia, um, there's been, uh, thanks to a very energetic and thorough uh, effort from the CP uh, AOR coordinator there, uh, the AOR and the uh, Food Security and Livelihood Cluster have come, uh, let's say, have agreed uh, uh, to a joint um, framework where uh, they have um, uh, common uh, vulnerability criteria, 
uh, common uh, geographical areas of intervention and uh, common initiatives. And this is happening uh, in an area uh, in Somalia, a context that has just been uh, hit by heavy drought. And we know how the drought has uh, further exacerbated uh, the impact on children of the conflict. So I keep on thinking, if this is happening in a place like Somalia, why don't try it out uh, elsewhere? Uh, I'm not saying that other contexts are less complex, but we do have a, a, a good starting point. And to have a further successes in other contexts, we should aim at uh, overcoming the assumption that mainstreaming child protection means uh, doing child protection programming. Because this cultural uh, assumption is the one that has led to uh, declassify child protection in many um, allocation uh, funds, uh, in many uh, processes that lead to uh, allocating funds. And uh, that's where the CP coordinator has to come in and uh, make sure uh, he convinces everyone, he or she convinces everyone that you can uh, prioritize a, a child-headed household in your food distribution. That's a good way of mainstreaming child protection. But if uh, that child and the children in that community uh, they can't access social services, uh, case management assistance, etc. We have actually failed in our goal to protect children. And this is quite worrying in a context like South Sudan. Uh, the latest uh, data from uh, the protection monitoring working group are actually uh, showing evidence that the um, crisis in South Sudan is a child protection crisis. So we really can't hide behind mainstreaming protection means doing protection. Um, thanks, Francesco. Those were such kind of powerful examples of um, some of the challenges we face as a sector, the importance of making sure that our work stays prioritized. Um, so I think that's so important. Um, Christina, I think, Christina from the Global Food Security Cluster, um, I think our efforts as child protection actors could be better improved by also understanding the perspective of food security actors. So may I ask you to share with us um, from your point of view, how do food security actors perceive collaboration with child protection? Um, and and why, why might this be? Thanks, Yang. Uh, okay, I, I think in general, many food security actors are not well aware of child protection issues, um, nor they really know how the child protection sector works. And this is actually a big barrier. So the way the collaboration is perceived by food security actors will really depend, I think, on the efforts and the success of child protection actors in explaining to their food security counterparts, to their colleagues in food security, um, what child protection risks are, where they are, and how they're linked to food insecurity or even to food security programming. Because you know? we have seen sometimes it's the response itself that can create child protection risks. So I think it's very important for food security actors to be aware of the potential harm that food insecurity has on, on children. Uh, and, and having this knowledge will help creating a bridge and a space for collaboration between the, the two sectors. Um, I, I think it would be important for child protection actors to be able to pass this message strongly, clearly, and especially in a non-technical way. Um, non-technical, so uh, no words that food security actors would not understand, uh, but then also very context specific. And sometimes we've seen in some countries collaboration between protection, child protection, GBV and food security being along the lines of guidelines, checklist, things that you have to do. And I believe this can somehow scare food security actors because it's something added on top of the work and something they don't really master. But if things are explained in a clear way, they're very context specific, very concrete. So highlighting what kind of child protection risk can be found or is found actually in, in a certain area. So I don't know, like worst forms of child labor, such as mining in this region of the country that is linked to this kind of 
the food insecurity or poverty, or it may be connected to some of the activities that have been done, this can really help taking action in a very concrete way and can really open for concrete collaboration among the two sectors. So I think the key is really in being able to open this communication in a clear, concrete, context-specific uh, way between the two. Thanks, Christina. And I, I really love this point because I think we have so many assumptions as child protection actors going into other spaces that other actors are also, you know, maybe experts or really knowledgeable about the things that we spend all of our days on. And that's that's not the case. And maybe it takes a specific skill to explain the work that we do in a non-technical way. So we just throw around the words like case management all the time, but I'm not sure that other sectors really understand what we do in case management, why it's so helpful, why sometimes case management is not the right approach. Um, we did an interesting poll um, in the workshops that uh, I shared last year between child protection and food security actors. And we basically asked food security actors, what were some of the different ways that children were being harmed by the lack of food based on their own knowledge? And then we asked child protection actors the same question, but from their programming perspective. And when we brought these two sectors together, it was really an opportunity for colleagues from both sectors to share their perceptions, to share needs assessments and recent data. And what I found was that food security actors were really interested in the child protection needs assessments. They were asking questions, they were interrogating, they wanted to know more about our methodology. So I think, like you said, Christina, if we are better as child protection actors in terms of approaching food security colleagues, finding ways to share this information, it can open doors and, and hopefully build opportunities. So thanks so much for, for this input. Um, Beth, as our um, donor representative, but obviously you are only you can only speak from VHA's perspective. Can you share um, with us a little bit from your perspective whether or not collaboration between child protection and food security is a priority, and um, if so, why? And then if if not, why not? Absolutely, and I'll also speak in the next next. Um question around um, how do you influence us if we are the target? Um, but in terms of do we see it as a priority 100%, we absolutely do. Integration, we know, between every sector um, is key and essential. I mean, for every reason, maximizing resources, making the most of entry points, providing holistic care, seeing outcomes that are mutually beneficial. Um, we also know that protection is a foundational concept for humanitarian assistance. So between protection mainstreaming and protection programming, um, we are, and well, protection mainstreaming with the do no harm across the other sectors and protection, everyone is getting to step in a little bit on this. We also know that the CPMS has standard 21, which speaks to the criticality of food security for children. So in every, for every reason, um, we believe that collaboration and integration is key. And what Francesco brought up around mainstreaming versus providing protection programming is absolutely key. And mainstreaming, if a food partner says, it's okay, we're out there, we're uh, mitigating GBV, we're identifying vulnerable children, that is not enough, full stop. Um, that does not fulfill a, um, does not provide a service um, that has a protective outcome necessarily. It is, it is the very basic way of working that we all must adhere to. Um, protection is an asset to food. And um, as you said, Yang, food security actors are interested in, and I would say the majority of other sectors are interested in what's happening at the protection side. These are the awful stories. The, the, these are the human interest stories um, alongside all the other pieces, but these are the very individual stories of um, violence against civilians and conflict that um, hurt all of our hearts um, and that we recognize must be addressed. Um, and then 
I wanted to respond to something you had said, <laughs> Christina. Oh, back to this idea of um, sharing with food actors the risks and, and our programming. We definitely don't know what we don't know. Um, and I would say this is a challenge to each of us. And I only myself, I would say, when was it two months ago, did I cross the aisle um, and start speaking internally to our food security um, advisors to really start critically looking at how do we better work together. But um, the challenge would be to make a friend in the food space, um, in our area of operation and just share, what are you doing? What am I doing? How can I help you? We are absolutely an asset, as is food to our efforts. Um, and if you gain one friend in the space and one potential for, even if it's not a partnership on paper, um, but if it is, we work in the same targeted area, we will do meaningful referrals and we will actually follow up and we will actually know when each other is out in the field, we will actually co-locate anything to that extent. It's an absolute win for kids. Sorry, I was, I was struggling to unmute. Um, Beth, I love this point about making a friend because indeed when we were collecting our um, examples of good practice last year, I would always ask, you know, why did this collaboration start? Um, did it come from your headquarters? Was it mandated by somebody? And more often than not, the answer was, well, we got along. So we would go out to dinner and share information or talk, or we sat next to each other in the office and we started chatting and then you know, I was able to negotiate for this in their next food security proposal. And sometimes, you know, crossing over to the other side of town, crossing the street, or even, you know, crossing the hallway can be really hard, but that does end up being kind of a way to start um, and to get the ball rolling is a very kind of, um, it sounds small, but it's, it's really not. And I've seen that it can be very impactful. Um, Beth, can I just quickly ask you, how often are you receiving proposals across your desk at BHA of integrated child protection and food security programming? I can't think of, like, if, if, if there's one right now, it's not coming to my mind, sadly. Yeah. I hate saying that. <laughs> no, I, th I think this is really important because it, it helps us push back, I think, a bit on this perception that donors are the main barrier or blockage to collaboration or to integrated programming. Um, and I wanted to ask you this, Beth, because um, I've heard the same from another, I would say, like one of the top five humanitarian donors in, in the past year that they've been trying to encourage partners to submit these types of innovative integrated proposals. Um, they had only ever received one in the past six years. And then when it came to implementation, it went back to siloed implementation. So I found it very useful when they put the onus back on us. Um, so I know you're gonna speak a little bit more to that point about um, later Beth, but I think that's just useful to um, for or um, for everyone for everyone to hear. So um, we've heard that collaboration between child protection and food security actors can potentially be a priority, but we as the child protection and humanitarian action community need to take more of a lead. We need to take more of the initiative, and there are some very kind of simple and practical ways to do so, such as being context specific meeting with food security actors, I've actually found that, you know, if you can find a food security specialist who used to work for a child focused organization, they have this unique perspective because they already kind of understand this child focused lens and, and they're so helpful in conversations. Um, but I want to move on to my next question for the panelists. And this is, you know, given everything we've just discussed, can you share with us a bit more what tactics, what approaches, what strategies that we as child protection community can use to continue pushing this agenda forward? So we've heard of a couple already, but Francesco, I want to hear from you again. What tips do you have for all of um, the child protection actors um, on um, advancing collaboration between mm -hmm. child protection and food security. How can we make this a priority in the context in which we're working? 
Well, uh, my main uh, advice is uh, uh, for other peers uh, to be very, um, let's say, engaged in the HNO HRP process because that's where you can really uh, make sure uh, child protection uh, becomes one of the focuses of uh, the humanitarian world. It takes a uh, uh, CP uh, coordinator maybe 20 times more in terms of time and energy uh, to make sure his topics are part of the HNO HRP process compared to a food security coordinator. But I mean, that's what we are paid for and that's what we <laughs> need to, uh, to make sure it happens. And, uh, I'm very happy to hear about the new version of the joint uh, intersectoral assessment uh, framework, uh, the uh, GF uh, 2.0. Uh, I'm yet to uh, learn a lot about it, but for the little I have, it, it will uh, um, make life easier for all uh, clusters uh, to reach uh, to, uh, let's say, common uh, uh, people in need uh, target, to have a common understanding of geographical locations uh, that have to be targeted. And so that, of course, will result uh, in a, a easier a collaboration between all sectors. Uh, of course, CP and food security can only benefit from that. And I would also like to underline that uh, if uh, child protection is uh, at the core or one of the focuses of the HNO HRP process, then it's easier for child protection um, actors to reach out also other uh, donors uh, beyond the uh, OCHA pool funded uh, um, pool funds, sorry. And so I can uh, uh, again quote how uh, uh, important it is for South Sudan, for instance, to be part of uh, the global uh, child protection and food security initiative that uh, you mentioned in your presentation. So yeah, these are core tips. Don't, don't uh, drop out the HNO, HRP process because then it would be so difficult to make sure child protection is hard by other humanitarian actors. Yeah, thanks for that, Francesco. You're just making me remember that a year ago I was trying to develop a proposal for an integrated child protection food security program which was um, across six contexts. So I went through all of the HNOs, the recent HRPs to try and justify this to the donor and I couldn't find a single reference and that just made, made us justifying this project so much harder. So thanks so much for, for sharing that, Francesco. Um, Beth, I'm gonna bring it back to you. Do you have any tips or advice for how we can influence donors like BHA? Yeah, Francesco has said it, get it in the HRP, please. Um, we as donors align our priorities with what the country is saying. Um, and we also, of course, look at what is happening at the global level with the cluster or AOR. Um, and definitely we are looking to you all to tell us where the needs are and where the funding should go. Um, and again, this comes back to the point of, we have to decide for ourselves that this is a priority um, and put it in there everywhere we can. Um, all the way, and practically speaking, so at the HRP level and at the global level with the AORs, this is defined as a priority. Okay, super. Now you have to take it to the next step and actually practically put it into your proposals and applications. And the question again in the chat from Michelle around how many actors have food and CP as specialties and the difficulty that is um, collaborating across partners. Um, and I will say absolutely true. Um, and actually we lean on those partners who do have the in-house expertise to please leave the way, lead the way and pilot for the rest of us so that you can identify best, best practices that others can implement. Um, and coming back around to um, what does this have to look like? We've, I've seen partners in the field um, who have no child protection expertise within. I'm thinking of a wash and nutrition partner who came to us to say, we recognized in the field how critical the child protection needs are of the kids we're serving. And we on our own without donor funding um, have just identified that we must <laughs> find the protection actors in our areas of operation. And we just must create simple partnerships to start with 
if we get funding, we'll just dig in that much further. But again, resources shouldn't be what hinder us. Um, I would say as much as it can be resources on the one side, when we talk about putting it into a proposal, um, it can also simply be our own time that may hinder us. Um, and that's back to having to dig in a little bit and spend time understanding what a collaboration would look like. Um, I think that is my main point. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks, Beth. I think you I think you've hit all the points. And yeah, I, I also recognize the comment in the chat about um, the number of organizations that have both CP and food security expertise. It's not a lot. It also tends to be international NGOs, and this leaves out opportunities for a lot of our brothers and sisters working for national organizations. That being said, I still think that we can think about collaboration more broadly and not only in terms of integrated programming. So even things like referrals between child protection actors and food security actors and vice versa, which does not cost any money, um, but these aren't functional or aren't being set up. In some of the workshops we did last year, we had, let's say, 30 food security and child protection partners in the room. And I would say very few could have a recent memory of when they had initiated a referral. So, right, so we can think about collab, and this is kind of part and parcel of our work as humanitarians, um, and that doesn't need to be funded. It should just be a given whether or not you have integrated funding. Um, but yeah, thanks so much for that. Oh, Beth, would you like to add something? Just a very quick practical note. Um, yeah. It does, in terms of the referrals, I think we all recognize also that our lists fill up very quickly. Um, and while we have good intentions with referrals, um, if someone brings a name um, after the food list has been filled up, there oftentimes isn't a chance and vice versa. If the food actor is referring over to a child protection actor whose case loads are overflowing, it's difficult. And so that it's a true challenge, um, and that is simply where these relationships at the beginning of a project can make all the difference, even if it's informal to say, hey, we're going to come to you quite steadily. Can you reserve a few spots for us? Yes. Yeah, exactly, Beth. And we're actually developing a really short e-module right now on this very issue. And it's basically about how you need to build these relationships from the very beginning. Um, otherwise, it, it just won't work. And we've heard a lot of examples from that in our various consultations. Um, Christina, um, I'd love to hear from you. Do you have any thoughts on what tactics um, you think could be effective in advancing child protection um, and food security collaboration. I'm not sure if what's been previously said in the examples from uh, Francesco and Beth about field level collaboration, whether that resonates um, with you. Go ahead, Christina. Thanks, Jan. Uh, well, definitely, and I think I mentioned it earlier, right? The importance of being very concrete, context specific at field level and field level, not at country level, but really in the field, in the locations where collaboration should be happening. So I think for me, that would be the most successful way of making this collaboration work. Uh, but I also agree with the point Francesco made about the importance of really seizing the opportunity of the HNO and the HRP to build that collaboration. And I think Elizabeth also mentioned it's good for them as, a, as donors, right, to see those uh, specifically highlighted. Uh, the good news on the GIAF, on the Joint and Intersectoral Analysis Framework, and I've been heavily involved personally <laughs> in the development of it. Um, the good news is that it actually really puts the accent on the overlaps and the linkages between the sectoral needs when it comes to the analysis. And this is the first step that will allow to build collaborations in terms of the response. So uh, we'll definitely, from the cluster perspective, we'll definitely support uh, the running and implementation of this analysis at field level, and hopefully it will really bring an added value as well for the collaboration between our two sectors. I also want to maybe mention something because the comment on the consortia, on the difficulties of finding actors that have both child protection and security expertise, it made me think that 
not necessarily it has to be the same organization. Of course, it's easier, let's say it's an advantage if the same organization has expertise on both, but it is possible to work uh, together in the same place at the same time um, between food security and child protection actors. And this is something that clusters as well, food security cluster and child protection AOR can take on. So the clusters system can, can be an avenue to build integrated strategies, integrated approaches. Um, and um, I don't think I have, unfortunately, any example on child protection and food security integrated strategy promoted by the clusters, but hopefully it will come with, especially in the pilot countries of the initiatives <laughs> that um, you mentioned earlier. But uh, I have an example with other clusters, the nutrition, wash and, and health, together with food security, um, in a few countries, they have developed integrated strategies and these strategies have been brought to donors. Um, the pool fund, for instance, the humanitarian funds, and we know that those are actually funding NGOs and national NGOs as, as priority right, uh, recipients. So Young, I think also the point that you made that you know, sometimes it's mostly international NGO that have expertise across both sectors. Well, that could probably cover the other side, right? And providing funding and opportunities for local organizations to implement programs in child protection and in food security, but programs that are under the umbrella of an integrated strategy that has been developed by the clusters themselves um, and funding has been advocated for by the clusters themselves. So it could, you know, kind of facilitate some of those barriers that local NGOs could um, could face uh, and lead to uh, an integrated implementation or, you know, an implementation at the same time in the same place and the joint, I would say, implementation and joint monitoring as well that clusters could also ensure. So there are I think avenues that could be explored and the cluster and the child protection AUR have a role to play in that. Um, said this, I still think that the, the barrier that was mentioned, I think in one of the first polls, uh, and it was the second one after limited funding, was understanding, like lack of understanding of each other's sector. I think that one needs to be sorted out in priority if you really want to advance on this collaboration. And sometimes even basics uh, of each other's sectors are not really well known. So the fact that for security actors, they work with a household approach. You know, it's not an individual approach. So when you refer a child, you actually refer the household of the child. <laughs> and the understanding from food security actors that uh, the child protection model is completely different from ours. It's, it's something that will we'll need to be tackled uh, um, as priority for sure. And indeed, informal chats, collaboration and sharing will be, will be beneficial for that, for building that understanding. So that's it from me. <laughs> Thanks, Jan. Thanks so much, Christina. And I really hope that we're, we'll be able to see um, some of these integrated child protection and food security strategies, similar maybe to the example that Francesco shared about Somalia earlier as well. But that sounds like a, a really strategic and an opportune way to advance to advance this discussion. So an exciting objective for us to take on as a wider community. Um, I'm actually working with Francesco and our colleagues um, in the food security cluster in South Sudan to organize a donor event um, later this summer, as well as some capacity strengthening opportunities for child protection and food security colleagues. So I think we can incorporate all of this, these excellent recommendations into the session that we're building. So thanks so much to my three panelists. Um, I really appreciated all of your insights and, and the discussion from all three of you. Um, I wanna uh, bring back our participants on the call. And I'm curious to hear from those in the room, um, did any of the suggestions, recommendations, tactics, or you know, any of the key issues that came out, did any of them stand out to you? Are there any of these that you think that you can apply or take forward in your own work going uh, going forward, whether you work at the global, regional, or field level? Um, so I think it's another it's our last Mentimeter link, um, and it's coming on the screen shortly. But also, do feel free to put it in the chat, um, and also feel free to share any questions you might have for any of our presenters or panelists in the chat as well. Um, so are, is there any kind of key tactics, approaches um, that you think you'd like to use or explore in your work? I think for me, it's for my side, I would say it's definitely exploring in which context we could possibly get an integrated 
framework endorsed by both cl uh, the cluster and the CPOR and also increased opportunities for funding for national organizations. Um, so I think for me, that's a really exciting uh, piece of uh, inspiration. And then also like to see what comes out of this, this GIF that Francesco and Christina um, have shared. So once it's being rolled out, I'm curious to see um, I'm curious to see uh, what comes out of that and whether that fosters greater collaboration and understanding across sectors. Um, the key word that I see coming out is relationship building. Um, and I think Elizabeth, I, uh, Beth, I might quote you in saying, make a friend, make a friend from another sector. Um, sometimes it's, it's really as easy as that. I've also seen examples where um, I heard of examples where uh, these friends that you make now, wherever you are in your career, they stay with you later on. So as you become more senior and senior as your position, um, it's gonna you're gonna come up to uh, come across these people again, um, and you'll really be able to leverage your relationships down the road. And I think I was talking to a colleague in a sub office working for WFP and DRC, um, and that was kind of the reason he gave me as to why collaboration was happening, because the two heads of agencies at some point in their past 30 years used to work for the same office. So again, it just comes back to relationship building and making a friend. Um, there's also the importance of coordination, and I think working through coordination mechanisms. And then I see a point on joint learning, um, which I think is really interesting and maybe something we haven't really touched upon in terms of learning and evidence. Um, I think it was you, Beth, and you've said this a couple of times that protection is a is complementary to food security. And I think if we can show that by integrating child protection, by collaborating with food security, that we're better able to also contribute to food security outcomes themselves, that we can better um, support um, healthy intra-household feeding dynamics, that this can also enable better collaboration. Um, put in the proposal, I love this. Yes, put it in your proposals. Um, you can't blame donors for not funding it if you don't try to put it in your proposals design with uh, integrated projects, talk within your organization. So if you work for an organization and you have food security colleagues, um, invite them for a coffee or a tea and just learn more about their work, learn more about what they're working on. So thanks so much everyone from the audience for adding these in. Um, we're nearing the end of our presentation. So I'm gonna quickly, and feel free to keep Feel free to keep adding in. I'm just going to quickly try and summarize where we've come to in terms of a child protection and food security strategy before we, we take some time for any uh, questions and answers um, and before we, we share some key resources. Um, so really, this is just the beginnings of a child protection and food security advocacy strategy. It really has to be context specific. We're gonna share our global evidence review, but this is global data. It will not be effective in pushing forward country level or field level collaboration. So be specific about how children in your local context are being impacted by food insecurity. Come up with some objectives. So we have a very general global objective, but maybe in your context, you wanna think about what are some of the next steps in terms of achievements that you can reach. Maybe it's something like in this year, um, food security actors consult and involve child protection actors in determining the selection criteria for um, uh, household for food assistance. Maybe it's a, as simple as that level of consultation and then building upon that. Identify your key targets and allies. So we have some key targets, but I'm not sure that we're always sufficiently leveraging our allies in the child protection space. So recognize that we also need to build um, coalitions and build strength across child protection allies and maybe um, uh, relying on our friends in the child protection AOR and child protection coordination mechanisms for their support. And then finally, tactics. I won't go through all these because you've just uh, summarized all the tactics perfectly for me on the next slide, um, but explore various tactics. Um, 
I think we're, I think we have realized that we're at the point where it's not reasonable to expect any type of robust collaboration by just demanding it without trying to understand how the other sector is working without recognizing that they have their own ways of working, but they also have their own constraints. Um, the level of reach that food security actors have, the level and um, degree of, let's say, pressure that they're facing for their own donors and their own programming um, is something that we also want to recognize and be sensitive to. Um, and then also put it in proposals, put it in HNOs, HRPs, meet with your food security colleagues, et cetera. Um, so I'm just going to stop it there, and I hope I haven't, for I'm sure I've forgotten something, but I hope it's um, very generally, that's a, that's a summary. Um, we don't have a lot of time left, but we set aside um, a few minutes for Q&A. Um, and I'm just going to ask Elspeth in the chat to help me identify um, a couple of questions and to direct them to any one of our panelists. Great. So I think um, the one question I can see that hasn't been answered yet is around uh, measurement. So there's a question on how important uh, do you think measurement and indicators are in advancing collaboration between child protection and food security? Um, based upon some of the experience with education, I think um, it would be good to know like what our panelists here think about advancing our work around measurement so having child protection indicators within systematically within food security programming so I'm not sure who the best directed that that could be I don't know if Christina or Francesco you'd like to first take a stab at yeah, that is a, a, a key point. Uh, thank you from, for bringing that on the table, to the table. And uh, I'll refer uh, you to, again, the experience in Somalia, where that's where uh, the um, integrated approach uh, uh, came out from. So they actually agreed on uh, common indicators and common targets. And uh, that uh, is a lot then uh, the, the monitoring. Uh, of the effectiveness and the impact of the joint programs. I don't know if I answered the question. And maybe if I can add, um, I do agree it is important indeed to have indicators and measurement. And it's especially since we are at the beginning of this collaboration, we need to show also that this works, right? And it's true that some even basic but metrics will always help. It is challenging. It's not always very easy to find the right indicators, um, especially for this kind of integrated joint programs, but uh, um, definitely needed. And I think also from the global level, we would be very happy to support uh, country and uh, cluster teams and partners to, to develop some of those indicators. Great, thank you so much. Um, so please, others, feel free to put questions in the chat box or also come off mic with your questions. Um, and while I have the floor, I actually want to take advantage and just ask Francesco, you mentioned in your, in, in your intervention um, the importance of influencing and engaging in HRP, so humanitarian response planning, planning and humanitarian needs overview processes. So could you elaborate on this a little bit more in terms of are there any sort of where the concrete entry points are and have you seen any good practices uh, in this regard? Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you for allowing me to expand on this. Uh, the, I, I will start with the challenge. Uh, again, uh, the HNO HRP process is often perceived as uh, uh, frustrating because uh, it's, uh, it's uh, very time consuming. Uh, it entails uh, participating to a lot of meetings, working a lot with your IMO, et cetera, et cetera. And so, and, but at the same time, it doesn't have an immediate, uh, um, immediate impact and uh, a better result in terms of funding. So you don't see immediately at the end of this process uh, money coming in. So this applies to agencies, to clusters, and to, uh, to NGOs. But it's too important for us uh, to, uh, let's say, um, drop out from it, uh, especially child protection actors who might, uh, sorry, coordinators, 
who might really um, surrender to the frustration. Because as everyone is saying, uh, if uh, child protection is not in the HRP, then uh, there is nowhere you're, you're going, and especially your partners in the CPO are, uh, are uh, um, that's, sorry, that attend the CPO are uh, good, good practices. Um, we are uh, together with the other AOR, uh, AORs and the protection cluster here in South Sudan. We managed uh, uh, to make sure protection uh, and the different uh, subtopics are uh, part of the uh, response. Uh, the response plan uh, and uh, of the specific uh, response plan to the Sudanese crisis. And uh, this has happened uh, lately after uh, a couple of uh, allocations where um, protection was not considered at all. So uh, it's really, uh, um, let's say the hint, the heads up is try to work very closely with the other uh, AORs and the protection cluster. Great, thank you so much. Um, Christina, would you like to add, add to this? Yeah, sure. Maybe from the perspective of the food security cluster and food security actors, I think there's still something that uh, child protection actors, NGOs could really do and we would appreciate, which is the fact that everything starts with the analysis and understanding what the needs are and what the risks are in terms of child protection. And sometimes uh, at our level, we may not have the expertise, we may not have the understanding. Sometimes maybe also the child protection OUR is not fully staffed, you know, at the time of the HNO and the HRP, this happens as well. It's, it's a practical reality, right? But uh, any child protection actors that feels like engaging with food security actors and with the food security cluster could actually reach out directly and offer to, for instance, join a meeting, a food security cluster meeting ahead, you know, of the, ahead or during the early stages of the HNO and explain what the risks are, what, you know, what information they are available on the child protection side. And this will actually lay the foundation to start discussing later on at the HRP stage, what could be some avenues, you know, for, for this collaboration, how the response could be better framed in the HRP. So it's, a, I think everybody can play a role and depending also on the context, you know, whether we have very strong clusters or maybe there's gaps there and then the NGOs themselves, you know, they can play a role or the agencies as well, they can play a role. There's absolutely um, always a need to support each other in, during the HNO and the HRP. Great, thank you so much for such a concrete suggestion. It sounds so simple, but I wonder how many times it actually happens in practice. Uh, so thank you so much for that. That's really very clear. Um, Yang, do we have time for one more question? Perhaps we could just... Yeah, sure, if there's one more question. Okay, well, there's no one in the chat box. Perhaps we could just ask each of the panelists um, just to share from their personal experience something they've really learned in trying to work with child protection and food security. So from your different, your different viewpoints, just one thing that you've learned that you'd like to share with the rest of the group here today. So perhaps we can start with Beth. I think I'll probably say uh, another thing I keep saying is just find one win. One, once, once you are collaborating, the other, the other pieces will come together, but find one small place to collaborate and, and let it grow from there. Great, thank you so much. Uh, Christina? Yeah, thanks Alice, but uh, I will probably use an example from my pre-food security cluster life, I was actually working for a protection uh, organization. And uh, I remember it was in Afghanistan when we really built a strong uh, relationship, uh, talking about relationships uh, with the food security actor that was working in the same area, in the same districts. Um, and uh, we did what I think has been mentioned before, right? Tried to really build referral channels um, from food security to child protection and from child protection to food security. And we tried at the beginning and indeed we faced the same struggles, you know, in terms of, yeah, lists are already full. We, we can't take anybody on board at the moment. And then we agreed that in our next proposals, we would find, put a sort of a contingency explaining very clearly in the narrative that we are built, we have built this relationship with the other sectors and we're trying to uh, promote uh, services for, for children, you know, across food security and child protection case management, and that we really wanted to kind of safeguard, you know, that space to be able to put in practice this collaboration. And it actually worked. So it's, um, it was an easy thing to do at the end, but uh, quite effective. 
Go there. Great, thank you so much. Um, and to Francesco? Well, uh, I, I think, um, let's say, for child protection actors, BINDEM clusters, agency, NGOs, etc., tagging in, especially in the context of uh, donor fatigue, tagging in uh, programs uh, uh, in the food security sector is a huge uh, funding opportunity that uh, otherwise it would be difficult to, uh, let's say, to access those funds. So working with uh, the capacity of uh, other food security actors to advocate, uh, to fundraise, et cetera, et cetera, is, is, is actually smart. On the other hand, um, for food security actors to show uh, they are also having protection impact uh, in their uh, programs uh, is, uh, is actually one of the most uh, interesting um, aspects of uh, monitoring, evaluation, et cetera, et cetera. Because uh, no one can uh, really uh, forget and undermine how many, uh, how much harm we do when we are implementing uh, hypersensitive programs uh, like food security programs that entail uh, uh, lots of supplies, a selection of beneficiaries, a, a lot of power of uh, the staff out there in the community. Uh, and so showing that they are not only reducing risks in terms of protection, but actually they're changing the lives of, uh, uh, of children. That's, that's something that, uh, uh, I mean, uh, it's quite interesting for, from a food security point of view. Great, thank you so much. So some great sort of examples here from, from our panelists, um, which I think really add to the richness of the session. So thank you so much. Um, and I think, Yang, I'll hand the floor back to you now, unless you think. Yeah, we just have one slide, and that's just a slide on some resources that, that already exist. And I've, uh, I think I've covered all the links in the chat. Um, so we've already kind of talked about key takeaways. I think there's a, either the next slide. Yes. Um, so the Alliance for Child Protection and Humanitarian Actions Advocacy Working Group has developed some advocacy resources. So if you're looking to strengthen your child protection advocacy, um, you should be able to join the community of practice and access those resources. But specific to child protection and food security, um, we have our global evidence review on the linkages between child protection, food security available in multiple languages. Um, we have some key recommendations for child protection actors, food security actors, donors, and other humanitarian stakeholders. And this came out of a global event that the Alliance, the Global Food Security Cluster, um, and PLAN co-hosted in October of last year. So you can find the recording and there's um, some really interesting case examples and also recommendations um, that were um, developed and disseminated after that. Um, there's also some case studies, tools and resources, other tools and resources, um, and we're, we're continuing to upload examples of these onto the website. Um, the Alliance has also developed a CPMS video on Standard 21, which is food security, and Standard 22, which is livelihoods. And this could also be just a really nice um, introduction and very accessible introduction for food security actors on why collaboration with child protection is important. We're in the process of developing several short e-modules on child protection and food security collaboration. Again, all of this is really intended to support all of the actors working at field level and trying to build better connections and relationships. So um, uh, that's forthcoming um, and several modules are in the process of being finalized or soon to be finalized. The global CPR is also currently finalizing a guidance document called the Child Protection and Food Security Thematic Action Guide. Um, and this includes some great examples on things that we can look at during assessment. So that will also be coming out this summer. And then finally, in case you're not aware, there are some resources developed by food security actors. And I'm just gonna highlight one of them here, which is WFP's Child Protection Mainstreaming Guide. So if you're working in a context where you're trying to collaborate with WFP, feel free to use this resource when you meet your WFP colleagues um, as another helpful aid to try to encourage collaboration. Um, but again, nothing beats relationship building. Um, so I hope, I hope this is useful. 
And if there's anything you can't find, um, if there are things that you would find useful, but you don't see here, please don't hesitate to reach out to me. I put my contact in the email. Um, we have some other um, activities and, and products that we're thinking of developing, but we really would value anyone's feedback or suggestions. How else can we support you to advance this collaboration and really prioritize it in your context? So I'm going to thank everyone for making the time to join our session today. I know it's at the end of a very long four days, but it was so special to us to have you here. And a shout out to Marta from Plan Germany, um, Francesco from the CPR of South Sudan, Christina from the global food security sector, and Beth from BHA for making the time to share um, to share some words of wisdom with us in how to improve our collaboration across these two sectors. So thanks so much, everybody. Um, Elspeth, I'm going to hand it over to you to explain what's happening next in terms of the annual meeting.